was working with Stan Getz, I guess it was 1963, and I got a call from Ron Carter and said that Miles was looking to put a group together and could I, would I be interested? And of course I, I, I would have jumped at it, but I, in those days, Miles was, uh, I guess having some substance abuse issues, I don't know for sure, but he was he was getting work and the guys would be on the job in Chicago, for example, and Miles would never show up. He was leaving them stranded, and this there was, that happened a number of times. And uh, I was had a steady job with Stan at the time and making you know whatever I was making, but uh, so I turned it down, I, you know, with all due respect, and I regret that now. Of course, uh, this was before Herbie came on. Uh, he hired Herbie after that, but I, I could have been part of that group, which which would have helped helped me in terms of just being to, to play with Miles, which is something I always wanted to do and never never was able to. Unfortunately, that group with Wayne and Tony and Ron uh, that would have been really special. But uh, unfortunately, I I didn't take it take any risk. I just wanted to stay with Stan and get a fairly regular income because he was doing what. He had just had the hit with Desafinado at that time, and he was working quite a bit. So uh, I chose to stay with him, but uh, in hindsight, I should have—I should have just taken taken the leap. That band uh, with Tony and Ron, et cetera, they were—they were not so constricted. Uh, uh, they were freer. Uh, they were perhaps, you know, just to do things a little more, explore a little more harmonically and rhythmically than they were with uh, Philly Joe and, and that band. But you know, for me, that was because um, I grew up listening to that group with Philly Joe and, and Paul and and Red Garland or Wynton and, and, and John. It was, that's my favorite uh, quintet of all time, a small group of all time. But, but the, the group uh, with Tony was uh, quite quite special uh, as well. But it was freer rhythmically and harmonically. That's you know, generally generally that would be just a quick overview. He was quite special. He was quite special. He was a, a prodigy, uh, of course, as you know. And, uh, uh, he heard things a little bit differently and was able to uh, get a lot of it out as a, as a young musician, that, which is unusual because um, most most of the time you just have to live. You know, those who are going to leave a, leave a mark on the music just live long enough and uh, evolve and, and develop a style that, that uh, influences other people who come after you. But he uh, he did it uh, early on, and again, I mean, we I, I say to myself when we talk to uh, people I talk with, and what what if you know the old what if what if Tony had lived longer, what if Coltrane had lived longer, uh, what would he be doing, uh, and so on and so forth, that that kind of thing. But um, and then you say, well, you know, it was maybe that was meant to be. This is as far as it was going to go with these different people. about getting a sound on the drums, which is, a lot of drummers don't even have a, a clue about that. Uh, Roy Haynes, in my way of thinking, uh, when I, I worked with him with Stan Getz, he knew how to tune the drums and uh, uh, made me aware of that, particularly. Uh, and Tony, Tony did as well, but playing with Tony, uh, which I frankly uh, enjoyed more than I, when I played with Roy, Tony's Tony's uh, conception uh, was a little freer, and I was able to uh, to uh, just play without feeling the, the the constriction that sometimes with Roy. I mean, Roy laid down a wonderful beat, and uh, but you sort of, in a way, had to play in that because to me, the the drum is the most important instrument in a small group, and to, in as far as determining what the feeling is. And if the drummer plays a certain way, you sort of have to go that way. I had an experience working briefly with Art Blakey as well, which I really didn't enjoy, 
because it was his way or the highway. However, listening to him on recordings and stuff, I love you know, he's one of my all time favorites, but playing with him was different. And the same with Roy, not to that extent, but uh, but with Tony, it was uh, a lot easier for me to to express myself. And if I had something, uh, he would follow, or he would, you know, there would be a, more of a dialogue, which is what I've always tried to get with the trio, just a, a conversation rather than me leading you know, bass and drums, such as it is. Uh, I prefer to have the, the uh, three-way dialogue going, and with Tony, I was able to do that. We just mostly was on the band bandstand. We did uh, a little playing up in Boston, uh, uh, although we were all living in New York at the time. But no, I, I uh, he was he, he was young. He was young, and uh, that was reflected uh, more off the bandstand. On the bandstand, he was very mature uh, in terms of his playing. He influenced a lot of uh, young young drummers and to this day. Uh, they talk very reverently about him. And the guys that I use, uh, and then it's nice because he he did he did influence the whole generation of drummers. I really think uh, the the music that I grew up listening to and uh, that I have played uh, really in terms of. Uh, I think it's run its course, essentially, in terms of innovators. I think really beyond Ornette or Coltrane, I don't know of anybody who's really, I, I would call an innovator since then. Uh, and uh, that's not to make, you know, sound, be depressed about it because there's so much to do within, within that realm of the music that I, that I, that I consider jazz um when you start involving you know hip-hop and doing different things and that's that, that's fine i have no problem with that it's but it's not not what i you know as i said heard as a as a kid and all through my you know all through the formative years and when i first came to new york etc so i think uh that that uh that jazz probably ended uh in terms of uh, that kind of, uh, that, you know, the way it was played, uh, probably with with, the, with Ornette and, and John uh, in these, I guess, late 60s, early 70s, and through the 70s. And then it's just a lot of the uh, younger musicians are just reinterpreting, uh, and there's some extremely talented people out there. They're going through uh, the history of the music and... Uh, Putting, you know, re reworking it, but there's nothing really that's new to my mind that's, that's come out since then. And it's the same with singers, any of the great innovators, you know, the Sarah Vaughns and Ella, and of course Billy, but uh, Shirley Horn, and I, I personally think Sheila Jordan is probably the last of that of that ilk. There's a lot of great young singers out there, but uh, there's nothing really new. You know, in, the, in terms of the involvement of the music, the way I I know it and, and love and grew up with it. I think the music uh, changes with great innovators, and as I said, Ornette and John were to me the last last major ones. Why? Because I think no no innovator. The stature of uh, John or Ornette has come along since then. I guess the most popular younger musician today is Quentin Marsalis. He's uh, just re revisiting a lot of the uh, traditions in jazz, starting at the, from the beginning and going forward. But um, he's done it in a very special way. But in terms of innovating, taking the, that, you know, that that's in my opinion, it's not there. But what he's doing is uh, he's able to reach out to a lot of people and make more people aware of it. So the audience, uh, the music has grown because of that, and, and that's that's great. You can tell that they uh, maybe maybe they're they're uh, 
first experience was listening to late Coltrane or, or Ornette or something like that. And those guys came up listening to uh, Charlie Parker and, and Louis Armstrong and Fats Waller and so on and so forth. And when they, when they played, you could, you could hear the history of their music, yet it was their, you know, what they did was very, very special and individual. The younger musicians uh, think that the music maybe started with Coltrane or, or Ornette, and they have no, no idea of what went before that. And that's reflected in their playing. And that's unfortunate. Uh, that's been my experience. A lot of these young musicians, if you play with them, uh, and uh, you do something that requires uh, them swinging, use that word, they don't. They don't know how to swing. When I do some teaching and... Uh, they never, they've never heard of Charlie Parker. Some of these kids, it's, it's, it's amazing to me. And, it, and that, that's, that's not good. That should be changed. That should be uh, rectified, hopefully. But uh, speaking as a, for an individual musician, they really should know the history, and a lot of them don't. <laughs> years old now and uh, life is you know the, the most of it is behind me so I'm looking uh, ahead and however long that's going to be but uh, it's a question of uh, just uh, just to, to try to you know I've hopefully have left some a little legacy and people uh, that I've had some influence on younger musicians and uh, I've been told that I do and people have come up to me and that's very gratifying of course but I just keep trying to get better and uh, um, not not stand still. Uh, but it's it's a whole your whole life experiences go into all that stuff to, to what you do musically uh, as any in any art, of course. And uh, in recent times, in the la within this last year, I've had a number of health issues, <clears throat> which has, has sort of uh, gotten my attention big time. But uh, all that goes into the music. The uh, and all that's reflected in whatever you're going through in your life.